But I do want to uh, spend a little bit of time giving you an overview of the book. And so let me find it. There we go. Um, and uh, this is the place where I'm usually supposed to give some kind of disclaimer about how uh, only I am responsible for what I say here and I completely absolve my co-author. Um, but at, at this point, you know, Jacob and I, this is our fourth book together and we sort of have the complete uh, Vulcan mind meld going. So I'm pretty sure everything that I will say today, he would say um, in, maybe in some very slightly different form. So he is completely responsible um, just as much as I am for, for any idiotic thing that I might say. Um, so like I said, this is our fourth book together and um, we hesitated um, long and hard um, before deciding that we wanted to write this book. Um, uh, like many analysts, I think we were uh, shocked by the outcome of the 2016 election. Uh, did not think that um, George Wallace could be elected president of the United States in, in 2016. Um, and uh, so it, uh, it took us a while to take a step back and think about what had happened and how to make sense of, of what had happened. Um, and of course, there was a deluge of books about uh, 2016 and about the Trump presidency. And so we kind of wondered whether we had anything distinctive to say, um, but ultimately decided that we did. Um, and uh, despite the title, the, the first sense of the book is that this is not a book about Donald Trump. Um, it's really an attempt to to assess what kind of structural situation gave rise uh, to, uh, to a Trump presidency uh, and how, how we could make sense of where, uh, where we were in the evolution of American politics and the American political economy to make such a thing uh, possible. And at the beginning of the book, we talk about two, I think conventional narratives, uh, particularly that you see among pundits, but also among a fair number of social scientists about um, the arrival of a Trump presidency uh, and, and what it reveals about American society and American politics. Uh, and I wanna, and it was, it was partly recognizing that we saw versions of these narratives over and over again uh, that led us to think, well, we really wanna, um, write something about this because we think these narrative, the, the first narrative we think is mostly wrong. And the second narrative we think is at best radically incomplete, even though it, it, it points to some important truths. Uh, so the, the first narrative is what we call the Republican Civil War narrative. Um, and actually Paul Ryan uh, himself uh, in, in sort of his own uh, retrospective on this, uh, to a journalist said, uh, what happened was that the, the Reagan wing of the party fought the Trump wing of the party and the Reagan wing lost, right? So there's a populist takeover of the Republican party in which the establishment, what we typically see is, is, is called the, the establishment is the main victim of what happened. We think for reasons I'll get to quite quickly uh, that this is a highly misleading a narrative of what, what has happened to the Republican Party uh, and particularly what has happened to the Republican Party when it governs. The second narrative, uh, which, um, uh, which we think does have really important elements of truth to it is a narrative that focuses on racial cleavages, racial resentment and just plain racism in American society and sees uh, Trumpism as the flowering of that. Uh, flowering is probably not the right metaphor to use, but um, but that you know basically what we see is simply a manifestation of the deep deep racial divides in American society now um, now uh, having taken hold of the Republican Party and one one way in which this narrative shows up and and like I said we we think that there's there are real truths in this narrative. And in fact, one of the things that we say early on in the book is um, that uh, something that we're gonna try to do in the book is to wrestle much more seriously than I think we have in our earlier work with uh, the role of racial divisions um, in, um, in American political economy. 
uh, and to try to make sense of that, but we think in a somewhat different way uh, than, um, than in, in this uh, pretty, pretty standard narrative, which in social science, at least among um, Americanists, political scientists studying the United States, it often takes the form, the way that I would put it is, uh, you, you have a variable that you call your racial resentment variable, and you have your um, economic anxiety variable, and you put them in a 100 meter dash to see which one crosses the finish line first. Um, in explaining who voted for Donald Trump. This is the way actually I think that a lot of behaviorists have approached this question. And when you do that, I think the evidence is pretty clear that if you put a head-to-head -head matchup between those variables, the racial resentment variable is going to win. Um, and um, that kind of dialogue about what's been going on has been so prevalent that it, in fact, it's become something of a, of a Twitter joke now to reference economic anxiety as an explanation for Trumpism. Uh, and, uh, and yet we think that that also doesn't get at, this narrative also doesn't get at important elements of, of the reality. And so I wanna start with a slide that I think at least all political scientists uh, should be required to study. Um, uh, this comes from Chris Warshaw, George Washington University. Um, aggregating a range of polling about major pieces of legislation passed uh, in the United States uh, since 1990. So going back over the last 30 years and looking at the really big bills. And if you look through this list, you'll see um, that, um, that you know, these, these are really kind of the pinnacle pieces of uh, domestic legislation passed in the last 30 years. And you can see what they're approval ratings were around the time that they came up for a final vote. Um, and uh, as you move from the, the bottom of the graph towards the top, you're coming closer to the present. And you can see you know, that most of these bills don't command the levels of support um, that they did back in the, in the early 90s. And a lot of that is just a reflection of American politics becoming more polarized. So you just can't get the very, very high levels of consensus, although you do on occasional things like uh, uh, like uh, Congress passing the minimum wage uh, after Democrats regained the majority in the House in 2007, but mostly you see more limited levels of support because if one party supports it, the other one doesn't. But when you move up to the um, uh, the first two years of the Trump presidency, you see two bills: the effort to repeal Obamacare, the Affordable Care Act. Um, and uh, the, the almost $2 trillion GOP tax, uh, tax cut, uh, which um, are spectacularly unpopular. Uh, and it's really a striking thing, I think, and really requires some kind of explanation. Why would a party regaining a majority in Congress uh, use it to pursue big, big pieces of legislation, highly visible pieces of legislation, uh, that are super unpopular. And for anybody who thinks uh, that we don't need to reference economics in order to understand what um, the Trump presidency has been about, I would really highlight these pieces of legislation. As soon as they get in a position uh, to pursue new policies, what they want to do is um, to roll back health care on millions of people for millions of people who, in fact, voted for Donald Trump and were big supporters of, of Donald Trump, and to use that money to produce big tax cuts uh, that are, as this slide shows, uh, highly, highly targeted um, on the very top of the income distribution, much more upwardly redistributive than even the George W. Bush tax cuts were. So th this. Um, table shows you, this, this is once the initial uh, freebies from the tax cut, some of which were directed at lower income or moderate income groups, uh, th those are all designed to expire or to wind down or to be swamped by other features of the change in the tax code um, by, uh, by 2027 or something. This is more what the permanent a structure those tax cuts look like. And so it's a pretty amazing thing to look at. Then you see um, that even though um, uh, they were cutting $2 trillion out of uh, the federal budget, which ought to allow them to spread the goodies pretty widely, uh, 
people in the bottom half of the income distribution, really all the way up to what is truly middle class in the United States, were going to end up net losers even before you took into account any program cuts or new tax increases that were going to have to be made to offset the two trillion dollars that you'd taken out of the budget, right? So unbelievably upwardly redistributed policy. Eighty-three percent of these. Uh, permanent benefits going to the top 1% of the income distribution. Um, so not surprising that key figures from the establishment, uh, Mitch McConnell uh, in 2017 says it was the best year for conservatives in the 30 years that he'd been here, the best, uh, best year on all fronts. Um, and uh, the Koch brothers, uh, Charles Koch adds, we've made more progress in the last five years. So going back, uh, to the rise of the Tea Party as well. More progress in the last five years than I had in the previous 50. Um, and it's not just these tax cuts, uh, it's the way in which uh, plutocrats were able to staff the new Trump administration. If you look at Interior or, uh, or the EPA or other key public agencies full of people who come right out of the Koch brothers network, Mike Pence was put in charge of um, the top level administrative positions uh, in the new Trump administration, lots of strong connections to the Koch network. So, it, so the bureaucracy gets pushed in a direction that is highly favorable to these interests. And of course, so does the Supreme Court uh, and uh, other federal courts. Uh, we tend to focus on the social conservatism of those appointees, uh, but the Supreme Court majority that exists now is the most pro-corporate Supreme Court uh, since, uh, since the early uh, 1930s. Really um, an astonishing shift there as well. So not surprising that these folks are so happy. Uh, um, and, um, but I think difficult to reconcile with either of those narratives that I suggested um, at the beginning. Um, they're at best incomplete, um, but probably worse than just incomplete. So how do we think about this? Well, the way that Jacob and I would start is by uh, recognizing what's happened to the American economy and how distinctive it is actually from what's happened in Europe, where there has been, as you can see from this slide, some growth in inequality uh, in the past um, uh, 40 years, uh, but not much, not much of a shift uh, towards the top 1% um, uh, in Western Europe. Uh, but in the United States, a dramatically different story, right? Now, most of you know this already, but I think seeing it contrasted uh, with the broader world of advanced capitalism, it's really stunning to see how distinctive the U.S. looks, what an outlier it is uh, with respect to the change in the income distribution. And of course, even this slide hides some of the most dramatic changes because we know that the top 1% uh, lumps together quite diverse set of actors that includes, I don't know, your, your successful surgeon um, or your, your very successful academic. Um, but uh, within that, you have the top 10th of 1% or the top 100th of 1% or top 1,000th of 1%, which is where the truly enormous winnings, uh, the, the plutocratic winnings have taken place uh, in, in the American economy. And the changes are, there are really quite stunning and, and somewhat hidden by, um, uh, by looking at uh, that mammoth group of the top 1%. Um, so that shift in inequality, we want to suggest, has three big political effects that we need to pay attention to. Um, one is that increasing uh, income inequality and economic inequality it's probably going to have an effect on the balance of, of political power. And this has been a major theme in our work. Uh, we spend only a little bit of time talking about it in this book because we've talked about it in, in other contexts. But it's really important to recognize that there has been a, a, a mammoth shift in the balance of organized power in American society. The flip side, of course, of this is the decline of organized labor, which has been much more striking in the United States uh, than it has been in most, um, in most countries within the world of advanced capitalism. Uh, the second change is that there's a growing divergence of preference and interest between those at the very top and everyone else, right? And it's not that they all had the same interests before, um, but, um, 
but obviously when you have a radical shift in the income distribution, things that are beneficial to the bottom 99% are, are less and less likely to be the same things that are beneficial to those in the tiny slice at the top. So that divergence of preferences, especially when it's combined with the, with the shift in power, we think is an important just initial indicator of why, how you might resolve that puzzle of you know, what is a government elected within a, a society that's supposed to be based on winning elections what is it doing producing massive public policies that benefit the top 1% of the income distribution at the expense of everybody else, right? There ought to be a real uh, tension there and a growing tension as society has become more unequal. And related to that is gonna be this final threat. Uh, and here we reprise the finding that goes all the way back to the birth of democracy, right? Where, where uh, com students of comparative politics have long emphasized that a fundamental challenge in, in creating a society that works with, with democratic institutions is that there's going to be a tension between the interests of traditional elites who are going to see their concerns threatened by democracy uh, and um, the possibility of having universal suffrage or at least an expanded suffrage. And so typically you're going to get moves towards democracy in societies that are becoming at least somewhat more equal um, and in societies that are able to find ways to make those elites feel like democracy is not going to threaten their, their, their fundamental interests. It may require some, some moderation on their part um, and um, some redistribution, but they're not going to be expropriated um, by democracies. Right? So as inequality grows, we want to suggest that there's, there's, there's a risk that those fears that came at the birth of democracy are going to reassert themselves. And as we develop that argument, um, oh, well, just actually, let me just show you a couple of quick slides here. Here's a slide about um, the growth of political power uh, for those at the top. Um, this is just looking at the share of campaign, federal campaign contributions coming uh, from the top 100th of 1% of the voting age population and how that shifted over time. Uh, quite astonishing, actually. Um, and then um, here's one on the preferences of, of the rich. So surveys asking how you feel about two uh, potential policies. One, uh, the very reactionary, economically reactionary Ryan budgets that were being discussed uh, following the rise of the Tea Party that would have uh, produce big tax cuts for the rich and big cuts in social spending for everybody else. And then also a survey question that asked about um, uh, extending the, ta the Bush tax cuts that were set to expire uh, around the same time. Uh, and this was asking people how they felt about a proposal that would have extended those tax cuts for everyone and not just for those making less than $400,000 a year. Um, and you can see it's not surprising, but it's stark, right? Um, that if you look at the general public or even just Republican voters, those are not popular policies, but they're very popular among Republican donors, especially, especially Republican donors with incomes over $250,000 a year, right? So the preferences of the wealthy in this case are very different uh, than the preferences of ordinary voters, even ordinary Republican voters. So in thinking about this, we found um, uh, a lot of insight going back to a wonderful book, prize-winning book by uh, Daniel Ziblatt, maybe better known to some of you for uh, his work with Steve Levitsky on how democracies die. Uh, but here's a book that he wrote a few years earlier, which looks at conservative parties and the birth of democracy. So. He's looking at a period, um, roughly a century before the period that Jacob and I are looking at, and he talks about what he describes as a conservative dilemma. He thinks uh, the, the stability of democracy is really going to be affected by, um, uh, by what happens to conservative parties. And he argues uh, that conservative parties are going to face this challenge because they're typically wedded to economic elites. They're the party that is more closely attached to economic elites, but now non-elites, at least some non-elites, uh, 
are gaining some say in politics. And in order to be able to compete in elections, conservative parties have to feel some way to respond, um, have to find some way to respond uh, to the cross pressures that they're gonna feel from this emerging electorate uh, and from their, um, their elite allies. Uh, and there are basically two ways Ziblatt says, in which you can respond um, to these cross-cutting pressures. Uh, and different conservative parties at different times um, uh, take different paths. Uh, as, and he focuses in particular on the experience of German conservatives, uh, a not, not a very happy story, and the happier story of the British Conservative Party, um, which pursues both of uh, these possible paths uh, but manages to do so in a, in a controlled way. So they moderate somewhat on economic issues. They, they do make important concessions to the emergence of a welfare state. And of course, Bismarck famously does that in Germany as well. Uh, but more, more importantly, I think more faithfully, they recognize that they need to refocus political conflict on what political scientists call second dimension issues. So if the first dimension is the right-left conflict around economic, uh, economic redistribution and economic regulation. The second dimension would be every other kind of issue that you might bring, every kind of social issue uh, that you might try to highlight in politics and make more important to politics with the hope that you'll be able to build up uh, political support that way. So you can think of um, a variety of possible appeals, whether they're around religious issues, uh, around nationalism, around uh, cultural divides, around racial and ethnic divides. These are all potentially second, potential second dimension cleavages that conservative parties are almost certain to activate in response to the conservative dilemma. And I think it's, it's important to recognize this, that Ziblatt argues that it's not a question of whether or not conservative parties are going to activate these second dimensions issues. They are going to do that. Um, the question is whether they can do so in a way that they can sort of manage that allows them to compete electorally, uh, but doesn't um, intensify conflict to such a degree in the society that it begins to rip democracy apart or rip the society apart. That's, that's really the challenge here. Um, and that same challenge exists in the United States, right? So just to, to illustrate this, um, there's some data um, on uh, public opinion, uh, actually developed this analysis developed by Lee Drutman, who was, uh, who's now at the New America Foundation, but was, uh, did his dissertation work uh, here at Berkeley, uh, and um, develops, developing this scale that looks at the economic dimension um, you know, which is basically your attitudes towards regulation and redistrib redistributional issues um, going from um, most liberal uh, to most conservative. Uh, and then a social dimension, which is a variety of moral questions, but also questions that tap into your attitudes towards immigration, racial resentment, uh, Muslims, and so on. Um, and you can see that there are a fair number of voters in 2016 uh, that drop nicely into um, the lower left and upper right quadrant. Um, and if you're in the lower left, if you're a liberal on uh, both these dimensions, you're gonna vote for Clinton probably. Uh, you might vote for a third party, but you're probably gonna vote for Clinton. If you're in the upper right, you're gonna vote uh, for, Don for Donald Trump. Uh, but neither of these groups is a majority. Um, and it turns out that the the libertarian quadrant is pretty empty, right? This is the, if you're uh, a social liberal, but an economic liberal, uh, an economic conservative, um, classic libertarian, there just aren't very many voters uh, that place themselves in that quadrant. There are a ton of voters in this cross uh, pressured um, quadrant up here where they're economically more liberal um, and, uh, but socially more conservative and potentially available to a conservative party for sort of second dimension appeals that amp up um, their, uh, the, re the relevance of those uh, social considerations in their voting behavior. And as we show in the book, this actually, Republicans have recognized this for a long time. Um, you know, we go back to looking at uh, the, the early 1980s, 
um, and important discussions within the party, fights within the party, where there was a recognition that, um, that a lot of the voters, the downscale voters that Republicans were hoping to att attract, they were economic populists uh, who were not going to be persuaded by Republican economic arguments, but potentially could be persuaded uh, by cultural appeals. Right? So um, that's the conservative dilemma in the U.S. Uh, and so uh, the way that Ziblatt puts this, and we carry some of this argument uh, forward in our analysis of American politics, uh, for conservatives on the losing side of the emerging class cleavage, he says, a precondition for participating in normal, as normal actors in democratic politics was to successfully introduce and manage the introduction of new lines of conflict into politics, right? Um, so Zibla says conservative parties are going to push second dimension themes. Uh, the question is whether they have a strong enough party organization to make democracy safe um, for these kinds of appeals. And in, in Ziblatt's analysis, he shows that mostly the Tory party managed this pretty well. They were able to amp up concerns for God and uh, King and country, um, but to do so in a way that didn't get, uh, that was controlled by the party and didn't become too intense. But he also notes that organizationally weak parties like the German conservatives that he writes about found that they couldn't manage this on their own, right? That, the, that they became more dependent on outside groups uh, who um, intensified these second dimension conflicts. Um, and that's basically the story that we um, tell, sadly, uh, for the United States. Um, brief aside here, um, much of the work on Trumpism and uh, what's happened to American politics in American political science has emphasized the growth of tribalism. Uh, and much of it is based on the analysis of individual voters and ask the question, you know, why is it that voters are so vulnerable, are so easily polarized? Um, why is it that they have become so, so uh, tribal? Uh, and to me, this is a little bit like asking, you know, why mice like cheese? Um, and though it turned out when I was looking for these, uh, for a slide for this today, I did a little bit of very in-depth research and learned that it's actually not true that mice like cheese, or at least they don't particularly like cheese. Um, they like sweeter foods than that actually. So if you're, if you're gonna try to, um, to bait them in a trap, you probably wouldn't use cheese. Um, but you get the basic idea that, that, a, that a lot of American behaviorists are out now demonstrating that mice like cheese, um, that they, um, th that voters respond to a sense of threat, um, that, um, that they think tribally about politics. But the real question to Jacob and I is, why is there so much more cheese around now um, than there was 40 years ago, right? Um, it isn't that human psychology has changed, but the kinds of appeals that are being made to voters have changed radically. Um, right, so you can't get there by, by just focusing on a kind of bottom-up story about um, voters um, feeling tribal or easily um, feeling outraged or threatened. You have to also understand, and not, it's, it's not that the bottom-up part of the story isn't important, but you also need a top-down story, which we tell in the book, about the way in which the Republican Party has built alliances with surrogate groups, right? Um, that are actually uh, maintain their organizations by stoking outrage, um, by making people feel threatened um, and generating membership that way. And it's important to re remember that these groups, which are in, in, in many cases deeply embedded in local communities, have a deep reach into local communities and are trusted in those communities, they're not really interested in building big tents. They don't need to build big tents the way that traditionally you would expect a big party to be focused on you know, making broad appeals that don't alienate too many people. Um, these surrogate groups and the ones that we focus on in the book are the National Rifle Association, the Christian right, yeah. and, um, and this bizarre but, um, but important form of surrogate group, which is right-wing media. Um, 
they are all um, interested in um, building their organizations and in many cases turning a profit um, by stoking outrage. And they're very, very good at it. Um, uh, they do it often by focusing on racial themes, either explicitly or implicitly. That's a really important part of what happens to turn a variety of possible appeals into ones that are either explicitly in the case of Trump or implicitly with kind of dog whistles that became an important part of Republican appeals, appeals earlier based on you know, the accentuation of white grievance. Uh, so that we, we absolutely believe that that's an important part of the story. Um, and so the story you get, so this is Paul Ryan's former chief of staff says, we fed the beast that ate us. Um, there's a kind of Pandora's box dynamic here, which, it, which is that in, in order to make these kind of second dimension appeals successful, uh, Republicans outsourced um, a lot of their efforts to mobilize voters uh, to these intense groups, the NRA, evangelicals, and uh, increasingly the extreme Catholic right as well, uh, and right-wing media uh, who have stoked second, dim second dimension politics. I'm going to run quickly through these slides because I'm going to run out of out of time, um, but we argue in the book that right-wing media is really an important part of this story. I think we underestimated it in our earlier work. Right-wing media is really different from left-wing media. Um, there's a clustering of audience around a relatively small number of, of venues that work very hard um, to cut off their audience from alternative sources of information. You know, we, uh, Trump, has trumpeted this idea of fake news, uh, but talk radio and Fox News had devoted enormous energy into convincing uh, its audience that, that they should ignore and detest mainstream media long before uh, Donald Trump uh, became a figure in politics. Um, so that insulation of their audience, which makes the audience much easier to manipulate, much easier um, to, it's much easier to get them to focus on what you want them to focus on. Uh, it's much easier to feed them conspiracy stories. All of this is truly distinctive to the United States uh, and, to, and to the American right in ways that you don't see on the left in the US and you don't see in, in most other countries. Uh, evangelicals, there's been a similar process of out, outrage stoking. Uh, you know, just one way of seeing this is as white evangelicals have become a core part of the Republican electorate, um, mobilization efforts directed at them have intensified. And that's actually produced this remarkable effect, which is that white evangelicals are, are, are now a pretty rapidly declining share of the national population, but not of the electorate, right? And that's because uh, they've really been organized into the electorate um, uh, I, again, here around a sort of sense of existential threat. Uh, we go into a, a lot of evidence documenting this uh, in the book. Uh, and finally, uh, the National Rifle Association has, uh, has played a similar kind of role. Um, and this, what I'm highlighting in this, in this uh, slide is the recent shift, and really it's only um, the last 20 years that this has happened with the continued radicalization and and growing organizational reach of the NRA. Um, uh, you know, if you ask uh, Republican voters and even NRA members whether they think that background checks are okay and so on, uh, they actually mostly say yes. A lot of you probably know this, that, you know, most NRA voters support background checks. Um, but at the same time, they've shifted quite dramatically in the emphasis that they, the priority that they place on protecting gun rights. Uh, the NRA has been very successful in turning um, gun issues, not into just some kind of policy debate, uh, but again, into a kind of existential threat when, uh, where people think um, that um, it's, we're just a few steps away um, from people having um, their core freedoms uh, taken away from them. And that's, so the NRA is also uh, uh, fed dramatically into the sense of, um, of threat uh, and resentment and outrage. Um, 
all of this has helped produce a, a Republican Party, which is a huge outlier comparatively. Um, this is just a, uh, this is a data based on analysis of platforms. It's imperfect, right? You could look at particular public policies, whether it has to do with the climate or taxes or health care. The Republican Party does not look like a normal conservative party in comparative perspective. It looks much more like an extreme party. Um, and, um, a, you know, typically parties that are much, much smaller than the Republican Party. Um, so you have this combination of a party that is, uh, in terms of its scale, it looks like a kind of catch-all catch party that you would expect a major conservative party to be, uh, but it's become a much, much more extreme party than its um, cross-national comparisons. I, and you can see this also if you look at attempts to measure the distribution of views in Congress. A lot of you will know this basic uh, data on they called uh, Pool Rosenthal scores or DW nominate scores uh, that look at uh, the voting behavior of members of Congress. And people often emphasize, Americans often emphasize how Republicans and Democrats have pulled away from each other. But the story is really very, very asymmetric. It's really much more about the growing extremism on the right, uh, which has um, continued, which has accelerated since uh, the early 1990s and continues apace. So this, this is basically a measure that says um, what percentage of the Republicans and Democrats in the House um, are either you know negative 0.5 or further right or positive 0.5 or further left. And you can see there, there just are not that many hard left uh, Democrats, but there are now overwhelmingly uh, the Republican caucus is made up of people more at, this, more at the extreme. Um, the Republican party is just a big, big um, outlier. Um, and so to understand it, we think you really need, it's not a case of, um, uh, an extreme populist party in which the establishment was defeated. Um, it is, if there was a civil war, it was, as we argue in a chapter of the book, a very civil war um, that would allow um, the Koch brothers and uh, Mitch McConnell be, to be super, super happy with the kinds of policies uh, that, were being, uh, that were being produced once Donald Trump came into office. You get this marriage a plutocracy and populism that involves um, not a compromise, but extremism on both fronts, right? As the party becomes uh, more driven by tribalism and identity and where these surrogate groups produce loyalty to the party, irrespective of the kinds of policies that Republicans pursue uh, when they're in office. So the, the Koch network, the Chamber of Commerce, um, ALEC, the American Legislative Exchange Council, Americans for Tax Reform, all these plutocratically oriented groups are super happy with most elements of what Republicans are doing uh, with their newfound power. Okay, one last element I just want to introduce, um, which is uh, to pick up quickly on another dimension of this. So, uh, and again, Ziblatt, Ziblatt's work is super helpful when he's talking about um, the birth of democracy. He says um, that um, parties, conservative parties that do not do a good job of managing the conservative dilemma, uh, uh, really you run two risks. One is that their surrogate groups are gonna run out of control, right? The Pandora's box problem. But the other thing is that they have another strategy that they can use to deal with the unpopularity of the policies that they're pursuing along with their economic elites. And that is to engage in various forms of vote rigging, right? Various ways or cheating, if you wanna put it that way. Um, if you can't convince a majority of voters and you're not willing to moderate your policies, are there things that you can do that make you less reliant upon a majority of voters? And of course, this has happened in the United States as well, in various ways. Um, what are we looking at now? Um, we're looking at the path of a recent eclipse in the United States, right? And the counties that went over, 
it, that it went over in its path across the United States, and whether those counties uh, voted for Hillary Clinton or for Donald Trump in 2016, right? So one easy way to visualize that most of the land mass of the United States uh, is, is majority Republican, right? Doesn't mean the population is majority Republican. We know that Hillary Clinton won more of the vote uh, than Donald Trump did, right? But in, under American electoral rules, right, as Jonathan Rodden has argued in, in a recent important book, Why Cities Lose, um, controlling landmass can make a huge difference. And American politics, as plutocratic populism has emerged, American politics has become more sharply divided between rural and urban areas, really in a way that is, has no precedent in American political history, with rural areas leaning increasingly uh, towards the Republican column, which is just, as many of you I'm sure know, is a huge um, political advantage. Right, so you can see this. I'm not going to dwell um, on this slide. We could come back and look at it more um, uh, more closely later on. The Electoral College now has um, a big Republican bias, as many of you know. Um, if the election is close, um, the chances that the Electoral College is going to tip towards the the popular vote loser um, is substantial. Um, but almost invariably, it's going to be the Republican Party that is going to be the beneficiary. It's very unlikely that Republicans are going to win the popular vote uh, but lose the Electoral College. But it could quite easily happen um, to a Democrat, as it has twice um, in the last 20 years. Um, the median Senate seat is much more Republican leaning uh, than, um, okay, I'm almost out of time, um, than. Um, uh, than the median voter in the country as a whole is. And the same is actually true uh, in the House for reasons that we could talk about. Um, Republicans have also gained in part because of their, um, their advantages in the Senate, um, they've gained a huge advantage in the courts. Uh, and it is a striking thing that four of the five uh, Republican appointed justices on the Supreme Court have either been appointed with the votes of senators who represented a minority of the US population, or in the case of Kavanaugh and Gorsuch, were nominated by presidents who had received the vote of the minority of the population, and then confirmed by the vote of senators who represented a minority of the US population. And most of you, I'm sure, recognize what a huge advantage it now is in American politics. Um, if you have a leg up in the Senate and you can use that leg up in the Senate and in the Electoral College uh, to gain control of the nation's very powerful courts as well and potentially use them uh, to gain further advantages uh, as has happened, for example, in Wisconsin, uh, where uh, gerrymandering produces you know, essentially a, a hung vote for president in 20, 2016, razor thin, but you can see the legislative districts, the assembly districts have been gerrymandered so that Republicans can lose the popular vote for the state legislature as they did in 2018 and still win over 60% of the seats. And you can get the speaker of the Wisconsin assembly, a Republican openly saying, what is a really stunning thing in a country that professes to be a democracy, um, that gee, you know, we actually would have a majority if you just didn't count Madison and Milwaukee, uh, the two largest uh, cities where most uh, citizens of Wisconsin live. Uh, so this has been happening uh, in the US. I wanna just uh, close so we'll have time with questions. Um, I'm sure we'll spend some time talking about the particular moment uh, that we're at in American politics. Uh, Jacob and I end the book with a kind of glass half empty, glass half full take. Um, our, um, and we can talk about whether we're on balance more pessimistic or more optimistic about where American politics is. If you wanted to say it's half empty, a couple of reasons why you might is because one is 
that the GOP is the power of the GOP, and here we come back to political economy, much, much more organized. Uh, I just came across uh, a short essay by this guy, Jerry Taylor, who was uh, uh, formerly prominent in ALEC and in the libertarian uh, think tank Cato, uh, but is now uh, the head of the Niskanen Institute, which is trying to find a sort of center-right middle way. Uh, and um, he has this passage, right, where he says, you know, Democrats, they need to think about power because Republicans are very good um, at thinking about power and pursuing initiatives when they get hold of power to consolidate their hold. And um, uh, Democrats had better wake up and start doing that a little bit, or uh, it may be too late. And of course, Republicans already have these two very, very important institutional strongholds uh, in the Senate and in the courts, the Senate backed up by the filibuster, which will give them a lot of influence, uh, even if uh, Democrats are able to gain um, a majority along with the presidency in this fall's election. If you wanted to be a little bit more optimistic about the future of American democracy, you could note the following things. You could note um, that, um, that the Republican coalition, electoral coalition is shrinking. Um, that, um, that California, the experience of the Republican party in California could be the image of the future of the Republican party if current trends continue and if democracy is able to hold together in the United States long enough to allow that, that demography to push further uh, in reshaping the party's electoral coalitions. Uh, Texas would be a good example. You know, Texas is getting very close uh, to the point of tipping uh, demographically. And it's very hard, I think, to picture uh, the, current, uh, the current iteration of the Republican Party being successful uh, in a context where um, Texas, uh, and you could, along with that, you could talk about North Carolina and Georgia uh, and Florida and Arizona, as those states move towards being blue states in terms of their, uh, their electorate, that's gonna put huge pr pressure um, on, uh, on the Republican Party. You could also point to the fact that Republicans are pursuing such extreme policies that it creates opportunities. Um, unwinding the um, 2017 Republican tax cuts gives you a lot of resource. You can make, most people would benefit. Uh, the overwhelming majority of Americans could benefit from policies that say rolled back uh, those corporate tax cuts and used the savings from that to distribute uh, resources uh, to a broader sector of voters. So, um, so there are opportunities uh, for a progressive coalition that come out of um, the extreme policy agenda uh, of the modern Republican Party. Uh, and I do think that there is a real possibility if you could push things in a different direction, um, that, that, would be re that that would be reinforcing it, that political reforms uh, that would consolidate uh, democratic competition would, if allowed to take hold, uh, really encourage the Republican Party uh, to start to shift its public policies. I don't want to be Pollyannish about it. Hopefully we'll have a chance in Q&A to talk about this uh, a little bit more. Um, but, uh, the, but the potential glimmer of hope here um, is that the kind of, uh, you know, openly racist second dimension agenda, which the Republican Party is embracing at the moment, is not an agenda um, that is easily, I think, reconciled with the shifts in the electorate that are taking place. And it's also not the kind of agenda that I think you can easily do a kind of halfway version of. So it, in time, uh, the party is forced to wrestle with uh, an, a transformed American electorate, the, the sh continued transition towards a multiracial polity, uh, you, you could reach a kind of tipping point uh, in which um, conser a conservative party, in order to retain its viability, would have to shift the kinds of strategies uh, that it pursued uh, in order to seek, in, in order to seek uh, successful national electoral victories. So with that glimmer of optimism, uh, which I can't say that I personally fully embrace, but I see it as a possible path, um, I'll stop and uh, open it up for questions and discussion.